Now, I told you I'd talk about Vioxx and what happened there, right? So remember this graph from earlier? This is the time it takes to develop a drug once you decide to develop it from the lab bench to the marketplace. And we saw that this number has gone up to 14 years in the 80s and 90s, but dropped in the 2000s, early 2000s. It dropped a year. Why? It's because we passed something, oops, passed something called the 1992 Prescription Drug User Fee Act. So everyone was complaining because Europe was getting new drugs before we were. People were having to go to Europe to get them or died waiting. Um, and, and so the FDA and the industry decided they would suggest this user fee act. Well, <laughs> of those 14 years, only two of those were due to the FDA looking over the 12 years of data that the drug company sent them. So it really, this act only gained a year for people who were dying waiting, but better than nothing. But there was a very high price that we're paying now for that. It started out that companies could pay an optional, an optional $100,000 to the FDA to quickly review their data. And the reason the FDA was asking for this money was because they needed more people to review the data so it wouldn't take so long. Today, it's a mandatory $3 million, well, I've got the number up there, $3,242.20, um, three, three, $3,242.26. It's a lot of money. And in, in 2016, uh, these user fees provided 72% of the total budget for the section of the FDA that approves drugs. So basically now, the industry has captured the FDA. They are paying the FDA's bills. And this is what's happened when you have regulation that is very stringent. This is not like a new phenomenon. This has happened in other industries as well. If the regulations are light, generally people accept them, they do their things, and all is well. When the regulations are stringent, there is what we call regulatory capture. And it happens, as I said, in, in a lot of industries. So the FDA knew Vioxx could cause heart attacks because David Graham, the examiner, said, hey, it causes heart attacks, went to his boss, and the boss told him, no, we're going to prove this drug because pharma is our client. Pharma is our client, not the American people, not Congress, pharma. So that's what happens with regulatory capture. And the regulatory capture happened because of the amendments driving up the time and cost of getting an FDA approval. This would never have been passed had the, had the, um, had the amendments, the 1960 amendments been passed. It would also not have been passed if those amendments had been passed and the FDA had a more reasonable approach to regulation. The industry would not have had to do that, but with only recovering costs uh, of two or three out of 10 drugs, this is what happens. And again, it's happened in many, many, many other industries. It's not just here. So I think this is not a sustainable situation. The industry is surviving only because of blockbuster drugs. And when the blockbusters stop and there's a few bad years, there's going to be some serious problems. But I spent a lot of time showing you that there is a big problem with these amendments in terms of pharmaceuticals. And I'm estimating that we've lost five years of our lives to those problems. But this is the real biggie. Shifting our medical paradigm from pre prevention to treatment is what these amendments did that I am estimating at least five years of our lives have have added five years of our lives have been lost and probably more. And I'm saying it this way because we don't have the studies, the level of studies that we have with the pharmaceutical industry that we can apply to prevention, unfortunately, not yet at least. So I have to tell you, I am, 
I am, it is my belief that this is even more serious than the drug material I've talked about. And I did that first because I knew I could get a number from the pharmaceutical industry. And doing that, I can, I, I have to assume that prevention is at least as good as the drugs. I believe it's better. I believe that it's probably, we've lost about 10 years of our lives because we haven't had this, but I won't stand on that because I just don't have the data, but that's my personal opinion. Okay. So, and let me share some things about all this, and then I'll go into detail. So drug companies used to make a lot of nutritional products or, or what we call um, alternative medicine. Um, and I just showed a couple of upjob ones here. Kaopectate was a big seller. It's basically clay, <laughs> um, an anti-diarrheal. Um, and then Unicap. Um, and there were, of course, one a day, multiple vitamins, things like this. Um, okay, so these are just help you meet the minimum daily requirement. They don't optimize your nutrition. But the companies were very big in this uh, prior to the amendments. And today, it's not well known, but most of the synthetic vitamins, you know, vitamin C, when we make it synthetically rather than isolate it and things like that, vitamin E, um, they come still from the pharmaceutical companies. They're making those raw materials because they, they can make things on a big scale. That's what they do. So they still are very involved in this. It's just most people don't know that. <laughs> Uh, for example, Upjohn was very involved in vitamin E. And um, anyhow, so I want you to know that. So you are aware that if pharmaceutical companies disappeared tomorrow, that a lot of our nutrient supplements would disappear as well. And that's not a good thing. So we just need to be aware. Okay. Now, why am I big on prevention? Well, <laughs> back in the days when I was in research, we did not have the ability to manipulate our animals genetically. And you know, animals are smart. When I tried to give my rats alcoholic liver disease by feeding them alcohol, they refused to drink it. Even if all I did is, if the only water that I gave them was full of alcohol, they would thirst to death rather than drink it. Yeah, they're not dumb. Of course, when I put chocolate in there, that was a different story. Then they would drink it. But uh, the thing I'm trying to get to is, is we had to play around with nutrition to get the, the models we wanted. And one of the things we did for something that looked like alcoholic cirrhosis, for example, was to take the choline, which is a B vitamin, out of their diet or make put very low levels. And so what happened is, we got a model that looked very much like human alcoholic liver disease by taking the choline out. Right, what does that mean? That means probably if you take enough choline with your alcohol, you probably will lower your chances of damaging your liver or damage it less. I'm not recommending drinking enough to damage your liver, but I'm just telling you that if you do drink, you know, taking choline is probably a good thing. It's a B vitamin, you can get it. Uh, you can get it in various ways too. So that's what we did. And so, of course, the research scientists that were doing this put this all together and go, okay, so optimal nutrition can help you fight off environmental uh, stresses and probably a lot of other disease too. So we were, we were taking care of our diets. We were supplementing. We were exercising, um, staying in good weight. And the medical doctors who were doing the clinical studies um, still smoked and drank. And um, I mean, it was, it was really interesting. Of course, it wasn't totally true. There were some doctors who were smart enough to do what we were doing, but I just found that interesting. So yes, I'm big on prevention. I've actually been on supplements since grad school and um, I won't be stopping anytime soon. Okay, but here's what happened after the amendments. Remember, I told you we needed patents, right? So, so we had some interesting, interesting problems that rose. I was on an airplane once, and the guy next to me, when he found out that I worked at Upjohn, he said, oh, I'm so glad to connect with you. He said, I have this disease that I think could use 
a drug your company's working on, the Lazaroids. Um, they were so called because no matter what we disease we gave them to, they seemed to really help our rats. <laughs> so he said, can you get me some Lazaroids? I don't think I have a whole lot of time. I said, well, I don't think so, but I will ask, you know. So I went to the person who was in charge of the Lazaroid development. And he said, no, we really can't give him any. Um, so he said, but just tell him to take lots of vitamin E. It'll do the same thing. <laughs> so why are we developing Lazaroids when people could just take vitamin E? Well, the reason is pretty clear. Vitamin E, we can't advertise it for helping people with disease without going through this FDA development process and getting an FDA approval to advertise vitamin E for them. Doesn't matter if it works. We can't do it. It's against the law. The FDA will come down on us and give us a hard time. That's terrible, but that's what's happening. Also, um, there are side effects of certain drugs that are helped by nutrients. For example, a lot of people are on statins, but the doctors who are in the know today always recommend that their patients also take coenzyme Q because statins deplete it in the, in the metabolism or the way that the body breaks down statins. And that gives you leg cramps and, and leg weakness and, and muscle problems, all kinds of things. But if you take coenzyme Q with it, uh, that relieves some of the problems. By the way, Statins are widely used, and there are studies that show they work, but they don't work by lowering cholesterol. It's, it's kind of one of those secrets in the industry. <laughs> so um, statins don't work by lowering cholesterol. They're anti-inflammatory to some extent. And as most of you know, I'm sure, um, inflammation is the bad guy here in, in trying to stay alive and, and have a good life. So anti-inflammatories are good things. Okay. Moving on, I want to talk about folic acid. It's another B vitamin. It's a B vitamin that if women take during their pregnancies, they can prevent um, a lot of what we call neural tube defects like spina bifida, which basically are, are malformations um, that require, usually require the um, children to be institutionalized. It's very sad. And taking folic acid prevents that. In fact, this, these spina bifida and these other things are just as bad as the thalidomide deformities, if not worse than we saw with thalidomide, right? So taking folic acid is a great thing. And um, so, of course, um, the folic acid manufacturers wanted to advertise that this product, a B vitamin, would help young women who were not yet pregnant because you had to have it, you know, in the first months of pregnancy. That, that would help them prevent these birth defects. And the FDA said, oh, if you do that, we're going to come after you. So they couldn't advertise. Meanwhile, over in Europe, they're, they're, you know, their governments are paying money to advertise to women and telling them, hey, take folic acid so you don't have a problem. And, and <laughs> even the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, started recommending for women to take folic acid and the FDA said to the folic manufacturers, if you, if you advertise and talk about the CDC's recommendation, we'll shut you down. So here in the U.S., most women did not hear about folic acid for several years. And it created what I call the American thalidomide. We had probably somewhere in the neighborhood of 25,000 babies who were born deformed, or were purposely aborted, because you can check for some of these defects in utero. Um, they were totally preventable if the FDA would have allowed the advertising, but it doesn't because the folic acid manufacturers haven't gone through this very expensive regulatory process so that they can claim efficacy, they can claim effectiveness of folic acid in neural tube defects. Now, what the FDA has done is it started saying that Grain manufacturers have to put folic acid in their grains, but that's really inefficient. A lot of women aren't going to be eating those grains, and if they do, are they getting enough folic acid? Uh, there's been studies showing that that was pretty ineffective. So, of course, today, 
doctors do try to get their uh, women to take women patients to take folic acid. Uh, usually, it's not folic acid itself; it's a form of folate. But um, in order to make sure that if they get pregnant, they won't have babies that are deformed when that whole thing could have been prevented. Also, fish oil. <laughs> so this is one that's especially near and dear to my heart. You know, I, I entered the Upjohn Company because they were the leading experts of the time in the industry in prostaglandin research. Prostaglandins and their metabolites today are known as eicosanoids. And if you take fish oil, you are taking the building blocks for the anti-inflammatory um, eicosanoids. There are inflammatory ones, anti-inflammatory ones, so there's this balancing act that they do. And of course, some drug companies realized that this was such an important nutrient that they wanted to make a drug out of it. So they put a little extra, I think it was a methyl group onto the fish oil um, and when you take that prescription fish oil, they actually went, jumped through the FDA hoops on this one because they thought it was that good. Once you take this prescription fish oil, the little methyl group comes off and you get to, I think it was a methyl group that they put on, um, you know, some chemical group there that falls off. So you get fish oil, prescription fish oil. Well, that's all, all great, but uh, my sister is a diabetic, so she went and priced out what she was paying for her current fish oil from a supplement company to, and it was a high quality supplement, uh, to the prescription fish oil. And what she found is her copay was equal to what she would have paid uh, with the supplement company. Of course, she's paying a copay, her insurance company's probably paying several times that. So now we've made fish oil expensive. And even though many doctors know it's fish oil is great, they won't recommend fish oil to their patients. They will recommend this pharmaceutical drug that costs many times more. And it's not as clean either. And by clean, I mean, you know, fish oil has a lot of contaminants. Um, and that's why you should probably think about molecular, molecularly distilled fish oil to get those things out. And in fact, there's fish oil on the market that is cleaner than this prescription fish oil. <laughs> Um, and that would come from the Zone Diet people, zonediet.com, uh, Barry Sears, who hired a chemist from Britain to make sure his fish oil was the best on the market. So a little thing on that. And again, without jumping through those hoops, doctors cannot tell their patients. Well, doctors can tell their patients because they, they can't. The pharmaceutical companies or the nutraceutical companies, the supplement companies, they cannot tell patients that their fish oil is going to do all those things the prescription fish oil does simply because they haven't jumped through all those hoops. And, oh, stem cell research. Okay, this is a biggie. Stem cells are, you know, they're the new frontier of really great medicine. And what, what some doctors have been doing, of course, is taking stem cells out of their patients and injecting them into their, they take them from the blood, they inject them like into their knees or joints to help them heal. And um, what happened was one doctor and especially realized that his older patients needed more stem cells. So in that case, what he did was he grew them up for a while and for a few days and then put them back into the patient and got better results. But the FDA said, no, you can't do that. It's okay if you take them out and inject them back in one day. But if you grow them in a Petri dish or test tube or whatever, and then put them back, no, no, now they are drugs. And you must jump through our regulatory hoops if you want to give your patients uh, more stem cells after you've grown them up. So, of course, he moved that part of his operation offshore. And so now only if you have the money to go offshore uh, can you get a better product um, and this is really crazy because really stem cell treatment is a lot cheaper than knee replacement. So this is another way in which our healthcare costs are, are hiked up in the medical sector <laughs> because doctors are not allowed to do the best procedure because the FDA has, has overstepped. And then there have been a lot of publications saying that doubling uh, D, uh, vitamin D levels uh, should 
add some time to our lives. The, the estimate I saw was two years. Um, and interestingly enough, during the COVID crisis, the patients who survived best were the ones with high vitamin D levels. And I could talk a little bit about um, uh, this patents and radiation cream, but I'm going to skip that because I'm I want to make sure I get through my talk uh, pretty much on time. I'm going to running just a bit late. Okay, so thalidomide takes us back to the future. Thalidomide is now on the market, or I should maybe say um, analogs of thalidomide with the same problems as thalidomide are back on the market, and it's treating leprosy, cancers testing for inflammatory disease and transplantation. Uh, so I just want to leave you with a thought that every drug problem, maybe not every drug, but most drugs, let's say, have some good uses. And they may have some bad side effects too. So it's, it's kind of a mixed bag. You have to get it for the right thing. I just thought I'd mention that because <laughs> most people don't know about it. Okay, so here's my conclusion. <clears throat> Side effects of regulation can be just as deadly and often more widespread than side effects from pharmaceutical drugs. I know that's not something most of us think about, think about it protecting us, but in many, many cases, and I would say almost every case, if not every case, this is true. Because what regulation does is it makes the decision for you instead of letting you make the decision with your doctor. So. I know that's something near and dear to most of your hearts. So whether we are regulators, this is good news, by the way. It doesn't sound like it at first, but whether we are regulators, pharmaceutical executives, elected officials, or the public, our lives, and those of our loved ones have been shortened by the amendments. Why is that good? Because when people wake up <laughs> and realize that they're affected by these things, I think they'll want the change. The change to go back to something <clears throat> excuse me, more reasonable. And that's a good thing because it gives us hope. So, right to try was passed to give us that hope. <clears throat> but it's got a problem. <clears throat> and excuse me. <clears throat> I have something in my throat I'm being treated for. It's not totally taken effect yet. <laughs> okay, so FDA approval is still needed to market a right to try drug. So companies are scared to let someone who approaches them for their drug, uh, let them have the right to try because the FDA might not look favorably on that. And if they slow down their approval process for their next drug, <clears throat> it's not going to help them. It's going to hurt them greatly. And there's nothing they can do about it because they have no legal recourse. So there have been, though, some, you know, remember we talked about the FDA can't be sued. So, so in some states, it's had minimal impact. There have been, I, I'm so glad to be able to say that there have been bold companies and doctors who have still gone ahead and utilized Right to Try. And Right to Try, I should have maybe explained it. I just assumed you all knew what it was. That's not a good assumption. Right to Try was passed recently. And what it does is it says that even if the drug is not approved by the FDA, you can go to the drug company and request it. And if they agree, you can try it. And the FDA has fought this for years. They've had a compassionate use program. And they've, what they do is they deny people until the very end when the drug is no longer useful. Then they allow them to take it. And then they can say, oh, yeah, we approve almost every compassionate use, yeah, which is really Really not true. In fact, we're going to talk about that in a minute. <laughs> um, now, there is another, another, um, another program that's been suggested. Heartland's Free to Choose Medicine doesn't have that particular Achilles heel. Uh, you can go to heartland.org to learn more about it. It is, it is a really establishes a second track for drugs after they've gone through the safety testing in humans and one um, small study that looks kind of like both at safety and effectiveness at a very low level, not the elaborate ones I talked about before. So the problem is, of course, it still has, requires um, some FDA involvement. But once the FDA is 
once the company has done these particular studies, then it can go into this free to choose medicine track where it never has to be approved. So it creates a second track and then people can decide, yes, I'll wait for the FDA approval or no, I won't. Um, and that gives us a little more freedom, not perfect freedom, but a little more. So I want to talk about certification a little bit. It's another way instead of regulation to protect us from bad drugs. Underwriters Laboratory does this for electrical equipment. If you see the little UL on the electrical equipment, what that means is underwriters have looked at it. They've given it their seal of approval, but there's no law that says you can't buy something that's electrical that doesn't have that seal. Now it's true most stores want to have the UL seal in their um, in their shop, but you can buy something that an electrician makes, <clears throat> and you don't have to have that seal. And and so that's why it's so nice because you have the final choice as a consumer. And before um, the amendment happened, there were actually third party certification of drugs. And, and these, uh, I've listed some here, and they either tested them themselves or they looked at all the research and either gave them the seal of approval or didn't. Um, physicians and pharmacists who actually use the reports. Um, I'm sorry, who actually used the drugs, wrote reports and published them in medical journals. And even, even there were even sources for the lay person, like the General Federation of Women's Club that wrote articles uh, for the consumer to understand. And this is a much better way than regulation because regulation takes the choice away from you. Certification gives you the choice. And the nice thing is you can get multiple, you know, check multiple certifiers and see what they say. It's kind of like the reviews on Amazon, you know, just like you can get different reviews on Amazon, you get different certification uh, people. And if they're all saying it's great, then, <laughs> you know, that gives you a pretty good idea. And there are some post amendment examples. In fact, the Abigail Alliance, um, which was started when the FDA refused Abigail, a lady who was dying of a particular cancer, um, the there was, a, there was a cancer drug in trials that was showing great promise in her types of cancer. FDA did not allow it to her till the last minute. Um, her father started the Abigail Alliance to track what the FDA was doing with cancer drugs. And um, the Abigail Alliance has recommended that 40 cancer drugs be approved. And the average was two years before the FDA's approval. Public Citizens has the other end of the spectrum. They report on dangerous drugs. Um, and um, They've reported on these dangers uh, for 11 out of 20 dangerous drugs, an average of 3.3 years before the FDA withdrew them. <laughs> now, so, and then the Life Extension Foundation reviews a lot of drugs that are, well, life extending or, you know, work in disease. And uh, by the way, the FDA tried to jail its founders for being co bringing coenzyme Q10 into the market. This is the, the nutrient that you take with statins to help alleviate those side effects. And I highly recommend their products and their analysis. So you can find that at lifeextension.com. They have a monthly magazine um, and a really great place. So if, if we have, but the bottom line of this slide is if we have lay people who are able to do these things, you know, <laughs> and do them pretty well, um, you know, think about what kind of certification we could have, not just with them, but with, you know, professionals who are dedicated to really teasing out all the, all the problems and the benefits of drugs. So this certification is very good. And so my recommendation are to repeal the amendments, maybe even disband the FDA. It's shown itself to be very unethical. It's not going to be helped by just putting a new head of the FDA and the whole the whole scheme is, is really problematic. We could talk about that a little more if you want. If the FDA remains, make it a certifying agency. It can make recommendations. If you don't like them, you don't have to listen to them because the companies won't need to have an FDA approval for their drug. Of course, if they put something horrible on the market, they can be sued. They'll be liable. The thing is that the FDA approval really lowers some um, the ability of someone to go in and really come after somebody for a drug liability. So this is another downside of the regulations. 
and the market is going to demand that we have a lot more certifiers. Competition is really the name of the game. And competition is what these regulations have taken away from us. I know my colleagues on the panel on, on um, Sunday were talking about how this is all capitalism at work. No, no, this is not capitalism. <laughs> capitalism is when the government does not interfere with the marketplace. And what we have is the government, the FDA, really interfering to such an extent that the industry has to capture the agency to survive. That's what we really have. And it's it's not, not uh, capitalism, not the free market. I don't like the word capitalism as much, but it's not the free market. The market is regulated best by competition. And that's what the FDA took away from us. It killed the small uh, drug manufacturers, it created this big pharma monolith, and it's it's um, the cartel, I guess, is really a better word for it, and uh, really denied us um, quick access to good drugs and puts the, puts the bad ones on the market for the industry. It's, it's just nuts. Okay, now, the idea, if you want to destroy big pharma, the best way to do it is to have competitors. And we've got to open it back up and stop the regulations that basically are making the marketplace very small and encouraging the consolidation of the industry and merging of the industry. If we don't do that, Big Pharma will always be with us with all of the problems, the ethical problems that we see today. Competitive market is the strongest regulator of all <laughs> because it lets you, the consumer, make the choices. Okay, so hopefully let's go back to one of the first slides I showed you. I told you what I was going to explain. I hope I have. I tried to explain how the Kiefer, Kiefer for Harris Amendments and Food and Drug Act had indirectly made patents mandatory for FDA approval, how it created the big pharma cartel, shifted our medical paradigm from prevention to treatment, shaved five to 10 years off each of our lives. Of course, that's a conservative estimate and how we can reverse these changes to reclaim the golden age of health that should have been ours. And we are, we are poised on that today. We could still have it happen for us, but we have to change what we're doing with the regulators. So I have gone into more detail in my book, Death by Regulation, uh, an Amazon bestseller in the US, Germany, and Canada. It's been endorsed by Ron Paul, Foster Campbell, and Dr. Jonathan Wright. Um, if you want to get a copy, of course, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it through my website. You can contact me through my website. And you can also um, email me at mary at ruart.com, my first name at my last name.com. I don't put it up on the screen because I get so much spam. I want to stop it. But, but feel free to always put the subject line if you email me, please. I heard your talk, um, the truth, truth about health. Um, and or, or heard you in a talk, have a question, something, so I don't think you're spam. And I want to thank you for paying attention to me for so long. And I hope you will ask one of the questions you have, and I will try to answer. And if I don't know, I will tell you that. Thank you. Mm -hmm.